All right, this is the uh, next installment of my series looking at Carl Bau's creation in the 21st century. Uh, this episode I'm looking at today is called Preponderance of Evidence and stars John Hefner. Uh, no relation to Hugh, I don't, I don't believe. Um, but John Hefner, uh, who is a adjunct or was an adjunct professor of mathematics uh, at Kilgore College. Um, but anyway, we'll get to, we'll get to his credentials down the road. Um, I guess I'm just going to get started here. Our program today demands a verdict. In fact, the title is Preponderance of Evidence. All right, this should be fun. Now, spoiler alert, uh, he doesn't actually give any evidence throughout the rest of the series. So um, if you're hoping to see some, this isn't the show for you. There will come a day when every one of us, whether we're born again Christians at the judgment seat of Christ or the uh, throngs uh, in myriad of the ages standing at the great white throne judgment, there will come a time when every one of us will give an account for every idle word, every incidental word. Every slanderous lie told to increase the uh, profits from the collection plate. We're considering this matter of life origins. And there's an incredible body of pyramid of evidence in support of divine orchestration, divine engineering, divine creation. And yet, strangely enough, none of this evidence, none of these mountains of evidence, this great pyramid of evidence, has ever made it into a single peer-reviewed journal article, never passed any type of scientific measure. The only place this evidence quote, evidence, flies, um, are in uh, church audiences for a completely scientifically illiterate crowd. That's the only place that this evidence carries any weight. They'll just walk up to me and say, do the math, you know, meaning that they have listened to you over a period of years, and you've been such a blessing. And, of course, you have more than 30 years uh, as head of math department, uh, Kilgore High School, and uh, adjunct professor at Kilgore College for a number of years, almost a decade now, I believe. Is that correct? Thirteen. Thirteen years. Well, that's almost a decade <laughs> plus quite a few. And uh, it is such a pleasure to have you with us on the program. It's always a joy. You have... Hey, this is quite the surprise. For the first time since I've been watching the series, Carl Bau doesn't outright lie about the credentials of his guests. He doesn't claim degrees the guest doesn't have or, or otherwise. Uh, he... It turns out I, I went through and found went to Kilgore College and got a hold of their uh, course schedules for the last several years. And turns out, you know what? He is an adjunct professor of mathematics at Kilgore College, which means that not every semester, uh, about every other every every few semesters, he teaches one section of intermediate algebra. So, and that's, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that as an insult. So he does actually adjunct. Now, if you don't know what an adjunct is, that's when um, there are too many students or there's overflow or they don't have a professor to teach a class or there's too many students for the existing professors to teach. Then they create another section of that class. And then if they'll sometimes hire outside of the college for a semester on a semester by semester basis for somebody to teach it. Um, it usually doesn't pay very well. It's not. I've, I've, I've adjuncted before. It's not. It's you know. It's better to get get on for job security purposes to have a, a more a more secure position than that. Um, but nonetheless, he legitimately teaches. So this this tells me that even he, he's got to have some math background. He actually probably has a master's degree. That's pretty typical for an adjunct in math. Um, that he probably has a ma a, a master's in math. Uh, so. That means that he's going to be 100% accurate and won't lie one tiny bit about any of the math concepts that he presents to us for the rest of the series, okay? When we are exposed to a truth, we must give an account for the consequences of that truth. Okay, so that must be why Carl Bau never presents any truth, because he's protecting all of us from, you know, the consequences of truth by never actually stating it. And would you today expose us to some weighty matters yes. that hopefully will encourage our viewers. I'll try. I was thinking recently that, you know, in essence, all of us are a juror. We are evaluating yes. data and coming to a conclusion of some kind. 
And I was thinking the court of public opinion has many jurors in it. Yes. And uh, we are to examine the evidence, I think, and uh, come to a reasonable conclusion yes. based on the preponderance of evidence. You know, the scripture says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, it says, test all things, hold fast what's good. Uh, and I so, like that. I do too. That's scriptural and that's true. So actually for the reasons that uh, Mr. Hefner stated here, that is why science, scientific truth, is not determined by a court of public opinion. Scientific truth is weighed against observational evidence, uh, tested through statistical methodologies, peer-reviewed by other experts in the field, and so on, to determine its, its accuracy, whether or not it's to be incorporated, um, added to existing theories, the basis for the creation of new theories, or simply tossed out. That we don't, science does not present its evidence to the public in a church in a, in a public forum and then ha say, let's take a vote as to who believes this is true. That's simply not how it works, and he knows that. Um, you know, uh, in spite of all the propagandistic onslaught of naturalism from the educational system, and you're a part of the educational system, but you're an honest educator. All right, first of all, fuck you, Carl. Honest educators. You know how many millions and millions of honest educators there are out there who don't hold your narrow viewpoint, who don't hold this bizarre, twisted little interpretation of scriptures that you hold, even Answers in Genesis, which is a literalist, Christian, er, old, young earth creationist organization, rejects almost everything that you say is true. So by your standard, even they're dishonest educators, okay? So, get, fuck off. I mean, that, that is so completely what's wrong with everything. Um, and second of all, let's just see, we're going to see down through the series how honest uh, Mr. Hefner really is. But the evolutionary onslaught of propaganda from the educational system, mandated by the educational system, radio, television, newspapers, uh, movies, every angle is uh, essentially derogatory toward a literal interpretation of the scriptures. Mm -hmm and essentially supportive of an atheistic religion, even in the public school system. Yes, yes. Now, that being the case, in spite of that, the polls show that over half of the people of the United States still believe that we came from Adam and Eve just a few thousand years ago. So innately, people know basically what the facts are. Yeah, that's right. So we are assaulted daily with every single source that we see in our daily lives assaults us with this naturalistic worldview. Now, you didn't say evolution. He said naturalistic worldview, right? You know, this view that there's this philosophical naturalism, that there's no such thing as God, is, is all that we're... Everything around us is atheistic in our, in our society. No, no, no God, no Christianity, nothing ever mentioned anywhere in our lives. Do we, are, are we Americans ever confronted with anything like that? We, we're never allowed to see or hear the Christian viewpoint on anything. Um, it's completely taken away from us in, in all of our radio and, and television and internet, everything. There's no mention of God anywhere. Um, it's a ridiculous viewpoint to take. But to, more important, when you're talking about, okay, so 50% of Americans reject evolution and believe in a literal six-day creation. Um, now, I don't know if that's where that stands in current, current facts or not. Um, but the reality is that's just sad. Is simply a sad stat that's going to really, um, if true, is going to be hurting us more and more and more as the world progresses scientifically and we are left behind. That's a simple consequence of that. Uh, because, again, at least in the biological sciences, nothing makes sense without evolution. Nothing. It, you simply cannot understand biology without evolution. It's impossible, and I know some people will say that's bullshit. I say bullshit to you too. Show me. Um, and then final point that he makes, okay, um, that these 50%, he explains away this 50% of people believing in God, believe, believing in evolution because we're innately endowed, right? Innately, like, like, you know, we're not taught that. We don't learn that anywhere. We're just born naturally knowing it, right? Until it's indoctrinated out of us by these evolutionists, right? That's why, all over the world, every 50% of everybody, right? Worldwide, 
Sweden, all those places, everybody's, you know, only 50% of people accept evolution in, in the whole world, right? Um, I just have chosen a handful of things. This is an ongoing presentation, really, because there's hundreds of pieces of evidence. But And again, not one shred of this evidence appears in any peer-reviewed journal. From the field of molecular biology, uh, one of the great scholars of our day, I think, is a man named Thomas Hines. And we correspond some, and I've read some of his works, and he does a wonderful job of breaking down some fairly complicated things Good. into bite-sized pieces Good. that we can handle. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not positive who this Thomas Hines is, the, one of the greatest scholars of our time. Um, there is a Thomas Hines, a, a molecular biologist, Thomas Hines, who is a professor emeritus, uh, retired professor from uh, University of Washington's pharmacology department, who has co-authored a number of textbooks on molecular biology. And I'm going to take a shot in the dark and assume that that is who our Mr. Hefner is referring to. Uh, but I questioned this. We I corresponded because uh, Thomas Hines is 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 a committed evolutionist, uh, and, and so I doubt that he would have supported anything that Mr. Hefner saying. Um, so when he says we have corresponded, I don't know if that means you shot him off an email and got a reply back from him, and that counts as your correspondent many times. Um, but anyway, more importantly, I'm going to make the accusation here. Maybe it's unfounded, and if so, I apologize that this is just simply name dropping. Uh, to sound important. And one of those concerns enzymes. We hear that, but I don't know that we really fully understand it. An enzyme is, uh, is a protein, and actually they're tiny machines that decrease the amount of energy needed for chemical reactions to take place, as well as to make the proper chemical reactions take place. All around, not a bad explanation of enzymes and, and how they function. Let's, let's hope he stops there and doesn't, you know, go any further with this. So it's safe to say without enzymes to bring about these right chemical reactions quickly, no cell could have ever lived. And I so like it's, it's another example illustrative of the principle of irreducible complexity, yes. a term coined by Michael Behe, as you know, from Lehigh University. So many things in life are irreducibly complex. Yes. I like to say you've got to have it all to have it at all. I like that. You can't and, and just... Oh. See? Should have stopped at the explanation of enzymes a couple of things here first of all and that any cell could function without enzymes that's probably true if we're looking at modern cells but again we're talking about the evolution of life we're not talking about a jumbled assortment of naked elements assembling themselves into an amoeba okay there's a whole bunch of steps in between that creationists like to pretend don't exist um, things that don't use enzymes things that use Elemental enzymes are catalysts, I'm sorry, not enzymes. Uh, things that use non-organic catalysts for their life functions, for basic life functions. And things that use simple enzymes. And then we've got things that use more advanced enzymes. And then pretty soon, with the scaffolding, you get creatures that can't exist without enzymes. Things that use enzymes to make other enzymes and... When you look at the modern product, you can easily scratch your head and go, how in the hell could that have evolved until you start looking at the framework, and so you start looking at the precursors, and then it makes a whole lot of sense. Now, yes, Michael B., he coined the term irreducible complexity, but again, as pe many, many people on here have said, if I, have, if I think about it, I'll put a great video on the subject by Qualia Soup. I'll put a link in the crotch bar. Um, but as Michael B., he, he coined the term, but he could not adequately define the term nor defend his usage of the term in a court of law. He simply wasn't able to. Every single example that he's used or he has proposed as irreducibly complex has been shown to be reducible and very much evolvable through stepwise patterns, through the scaffolding, through all a number of different plausible mechanisms, his irreducible complexity has fallen apart.